Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast, the podcast dedicated to healthcare security, safety, and emergency management. If you are involved with a healthcare security program or desire to be, this podcast is for you. Join the conversation as we discuss the issues that matter to healthcare security professionals while leveraging the expertise of healthcare security thought leaders and experts in personal development. And now, here's your host, Brian Hamilton. Welcome to episode 101 of the Healthcare Security Cast for Tuesday, April the 27th. Before we jump into today's show, I just want to thank our sponsors and collaborators, 3D Network Technology, Genetech, the Change Execution Group and 360 Life Transformations, Canadian Security Magazine, and Omnigo. And now let's jump into today's show where we're joined by Brad Moody. Brad, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Now I'm going to start with the question that everybody is dying to know. Who is Brad Moody? It's a great question. When I find out, I'll let you know. But uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, I've always had a pretty diverse career starting off in logistics and transportation, moved in from there into banking, moved from banking into risk, moved risk into security. And so I've kind of taken all these little backgrounds and nuggets of knowledge and kind of created a, a kind of a, a holistic view over the enterprise risk kind of area, which attracted me to where I'm currently employed at Large Risk Group where we're an enterprise risk solutions company to where we work with insurers and, and clients to take a look at their overall environment, may it be physical, cyber, financial, employee, and we take a look from a global perspective to try to kind of help our experiences mitigate that risk. Excellent. All right, can, can you uh, expand a little bit more about your current role and, and what experiences you've had that really helped form who you are today and guide what you do? Yeah, sure. So some of the things that I've learned about the pure security risk where it translates throughout the differences of different organizations or different types of work product. You know, if it may be in the financial services industry, that's one thing, but that, you know, you kind of treat security in the same kind of perspective as you would money, as you would people, as brands, profits, and how it trickles down the line. So what we do, we've, we've been able to kind of incorporate our skills and through our associations with our, our leadership to work within organizations and hospitals specifically to where we'll help the hospitals kind of mitigate some of the risks and take a look at some of those experiences that we've seen of how people could break in through an outside window, through other, some kind of event. And even now, as, it's, it's, as we're talking today about the, the cyber threat, uh, which is a inherently um, critical at this point. Excellent. Now, I guess before we actually dive into the discussion, there's a lot of, a lot of associations that you've been a part of, conferences that you've spoken at, work groups that you've been a part of. Would you mind sharing some of that with us just to give just to give everybody a bit of context? Sure, sure. So, uh, of course, you know, the, the main one, you know, the as is, I think every security professional is affiliated with, you know, as is been critical point of that's that's a good point to learn and to build relationships there. So with, beyond as is, you know, I've spoken at other conferences, ATMIA, I was on their board for their government regulations committee for a period of time. ISC West is another important piece of that, the International Security Conference. Secured Cash Transport Association, which is the financial services, insurance, and, and armored car organizations. And then we get into, of course, uh, IHSS, which is a, a huge contributor to what we do and understanding exactly what the risks are within the hospital networks and understand the unique characteristics that bring in with the hospitals. Excellent stuff. Now, today, in terms of that discussion around cyber, we'll be focusing on the value of customer information Obviously, again, very relevant in the healthcare environment. Can you touch on some of the common challenges that you see in protecting that information? Sure. So, the, you know, the, some of the protection of the information what we see is just a lack of controls and processes because to enable those culturally, sometimes it has to be, it has to be a top-down influence. And whenever you have that type of change, you know, everyone has the opinion of, oh, that would never happen here. Or Jane has been in patient records forever. She knows everything there, there is to know about patient records. Well, what happens when she retires? You know, what kind of gaps and processes are there that are not covered? So when we take a look at from the healthcare perspective, it, a lot of it comes down to, you know, it's not a matter of trust, but it's a matter of, I have a systematic control that allows me to interfere in the ability for, for something bad to happen. Okay. That's the key word is bad. 
So especially with patient records, if their records are stored in a building, how is that building secured? If it's an IT solution that's out there, because now IT is the easiest way to, to gather more information. So when you look at IT perspective, what is being done from the penetration testing area? What is being done from the vulnerability assessments independently from, the, from their own networks to try to mitigate these risks? Now, just in terms of some of those, some of those lack of physical controls, what are some, I guess, some common pitfalls that you've seen and some good best practices to correct some of those? Sure. So from the physical perspective, it's, it's amazing. I will walk around a building with blueprints and I'll just hold them up, you know, and I'll, I'll, oh yeah. And I'll look and I'll look at this door and the blueprints could be for a different building in a different country. It doesn't matter. Right. And inherently people like, oh, where are you trying to go? Well, can I, where's your hot lab at? You know, so I can get a hold of some cobalt and seizing on the, you know, seeing how far I can get it, how far I can penetrate or, or, you know, Hey, where's your, where's your building management system? So um, they'll get me in, in touch with engineering and, and I probably eight times out of 10, they'll give me a code that a little of the pillow of the five digit pen codes, they'll give me the pen code and they'll say, well, Hey, you can, you know, this pen code's good for, the, you know, throughout the whole building, or you can kind of look at those pen codes and see the worn down, you know, three of the numbers are worn down. You can kind of figure out a combination real quickly to figure out how to open those doors. Another way is it sounds, sounds crazy and kind of maniacal. Of course, we're doing this because we're retained, but you know, it's pretty simple to find a lab coat, right? So if I put on a lab coat and I look official, I can kind of talk with arrogance and people will guide me if not even let me into a location to do whatever I need to about Beeson's, whatever I want to do. And it's funny you mentioned the pin codes because the one thing I remember just from working in, in different hospitals was so many people would just write the actual combination in the frame of the door. Yeah. And, and there were, I remember there were times where I'd, I'd go to open a door and I would actually just try to see what's worked if I, you know, if I didn't want to grab my keys, you know, and a lot of times as there, as the code changes, people are writing the new code in there. So it'd just be a matter of trying until you find the right one. That's correct. It's funny how people don't think things through. It's that classic battle of convenience over security. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, are there any, you know, in, ter- in terms of the penetration testing, are there any specific situations where you've supported clients that, that stick out as a learning experience? I guess, from your perspective, actually. So the cyber actors that are out there, you know, they're, they're actually fairly lazy. And I don't mean that in any disrespect, but they're like water and taking the path of least resistance. So what, a, what an actor will do is they will penetrate a system through the easiest way. And social engineering is, is a large focus over what should be in any organization. So within the social engineering networks, that's basically you get an email and it says, hey, click here for a free, you know, Starbucks gift card for 25 bucks, right? No one's going to give you for a survey. They're, you know, answer this quick survey and get, that's not happening. They're doing that because there's some type of information that they want. So when that happens, um, there's a lot of things that are, that are viewable from the actual emails or from the, the, the exchange of information that you may get. COVID is adding a pretty large perspective that on fraud opportunities. So a lot of people are thinking, especially with patient records, hey, I'm pr- trying to process this payment for these COVID vaccinations or these, these COVID lab results. Um, I need new payment information or, hey, open up, here's the PDF to a known source. Hey, open up this and I need to change the routing instructions for, you know, for payment. They're doing that to get the patient records. So they're doing that to see how far they can get within the system so that they can, they can go ahead and get that, gather that information. Now, the craziest thing is they may not act on it for several years. A, a good actor will sit there and retain information and hold on to it for a very long period of time to try to get what they can off the documents. And it's interesting you mentioned that now. The one thing that a lot of us assume is that you need to be you need to get a, a lot of information as you know that threat, that person who's creating the threat, to actually be able to do some damage. But I understand that's not necessarily the case. No, 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 not all. So. You know, you really need, need two pieces of information in order to start capturing someone's identity. Name, obviously, that's a pretty good one. We call that a clue, right? Uh, getting their name. But, you know, when you look at the patient health records of registration, it's got more information other, other than a tax return. It has a lot of information on there. Your social security number, date of birth, address. It has your primary contact, your emergency contact, insurance information. So the, your employer, it has enough information there that it you get, you get one patient record, you can do a lot of damage. You can do a lot of damage. So it's actually well known that 
that children's patient records are actually those of kind of, um, are of, of high interest because even though they're under 18, they don't have credit and all that kind of good stuff, but they have a long time to start gathering information. So at the point when they turn 18, they go off to college, they apply for their first credit card like all college students do. As soon as that happens, they have enough information where they can go ahead and, and create some really, really bad environment tools for uh, to the kids. Now, something you mentioned earlier was the top-down approach, how that has to exist in an organization in terms of just establishing the right culture. Hmm. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? What are some of the important points that organizations need to be cognizant of? Sure. So, the, you know, uh, the, the number one complaint that I hear from people is that, oh, I've got to change my password so many times. I've got to change it every, every 90 days. Well, you know what? Be good. It's not every, you know, be glad it's not every 30 days. But, you know, it doesn't have, passwords are simple. It can be as, it's, it should be a phrase, a common phrase, right? There's this, this one case that, that's gone through through a peer of mine that someone's, someone's password, it listed all the dwarfs and then the capital of a city. And the, the, they're like, well, why did you do that? And they're like, well, you said it had to be eight characters long with a capital. And so they <laughs> use like mini Pluto, you know, and then a capital of a city. And because they didn't think about it, but guess what? It's a pretty strong password because the length is the important part. You could put all special characters, but you know, there's ciphers out there that can decode these passwords. You know, four-digit passcode is very quick. A five-digit, you double that time. So it ex exponentially gets longer and longer. So the, the idea about the top-down top approach is if I have to do it, if my boss has to do it, then my boss has to say to everybody else, hey, guys, here's the key things that this means. It saves, it saves our profits. You know, trillions of dollars are lost to fraud and cyber penetration every year from organizations. That, that affects healthcare benefits. That affects payroll. That affects employment that affects 401k, a whole bunch of different stuff. So it's like, hey, I appreciate the opportunity to do it. We should all do this and adopt this. It's, it's a really important culture feature. And organizations that, that take shortcuts, that's where, that's where problems happen. It's, that's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's an important feature that needs to be focused. Right. And, and the other thing that you mentioned too was that attitude of, you know, it'll never happen here. And I think yeah. we've, all, we've all seen that in some area of our, our work or you know, in life, where there's just this assumption that it, it, it couldn't happen to you. What are some of the ways that you, that you use or your team use to get people away from that kind of thinking? Sure. So we noticed that, you know, uh, long-term employees are, are at a high risk for fraud, right? Because, they, you know, there's the rationalization part of the triangle, or the fraud triangle that, that takes effect of, hey, I'm ending my career or I'm seeing cutbacks, I'm seeing layoffs, and there's the paranoia, and hey, I'm rational. I'm, I'm owed this, right? So that, that's when that now that, that, that they want that feature off of that. The other side of it is, is that people don't understand it because it becomes very complacent. You know, the things are just occurring, they're happening because you have a well-oiled machine. You know, I use pretty often the demonstration of, you know, your kid's refrigerator art. So your second grader comes home and they bring back a finger painting and the finger painting is, you know, hey, my kid is brilliant. It's going to be the, the next great artist. They put it on the fridge and they show everybody and everybody marvels over it. Well, I dare to say in two months time, you don't know what is on the fridge anymore. You don't have that vision because it's become part of the framework. So, so within that, the complacency portion fits in. So what does that mean? That means that you start propping doors open because, hey, I'm just going to run out to the bathroom real quick. Or, or hey, someone so-and-so called, they're coming down to get, grab some patient records. I, you know, I'm probably going to be in the back. I'll leave the door open for them so they can come in. And that's a, that's a problem, right? It's, it's not necessarily a trust, but it's a control measure that's oftentimes uh, bypassed. Right. And, and that's such a common one in our environment, just because, again, the people who gravitate towards working in the healthcare environment tend to be people who are, you know, who want to be helpful. Yeah. Well, that's right. Because because quite honestly, you know, nobody, you know, nobody wants to be in a hospital. Right? If somebody wants to go to a hospital, then you know, even if they work there, you know, nobody. I'd rather go play golf every day than, than work. But the, the feature of it is that you know, it's it's a place where you you know, the people that work there are very kind is the wrong word, but it's the, the right word. They want to help. They're helping people by nature. And and again, walk around with blueprints. It's an error that some person that works in you know transportation, you know. Uh, will tell me where to go. I tell you, the people that, that never help us, 
or or the RNs, the great heroes on the floor, they're they're you know they're they're pretty strict, and because they, they understand the risk there. So uh, the nurses are the people that I really truly appreciate. That's for sure. <laughs> awesome stuff. Now, from a, a physical security perspective, what are some of the things that we can do in addition to really ensure that we're safekeeping that that information? Um, yeah. So when you look at you know medical documents, they're historically you know they're they need to be considered private, right? And and again, you work around them every day. You don't re- you really lose focus of what's there. The other thing that we see a lot of times, it's the simple blocking and tackling of of you know the no one's using alarms anymore, right? Um, or they or they have them to where they're on uh, certain hours of the day. So in a business continuity event, uh, let's say an ice storm comes through and they close the clinic that normally closes at seven, so everybody goes home at four. Well, those doors are open, if open, right? They're, they're traditionally open. So if I'm a bad guy, I kind of know that. Or if I'm a person that works there, I kind of know that. So we've had cases in the past where, you know, an example of a, of a, of a bad PII event, we, we had a temporary employee that worked in patient records to where she was using a thumb drive and was snapshotting pictures of, of patient information and putting on a thumb drive and taking home every day. Her husband um, was a was selling this information on the dark web. So the he was caught while she was at work. So with all this patient information, they were a married couple of different last names. They had a different, even different addresses for the residents. So the IT department, what they did was they had to make an emergency fix to disable the, um, the thumb drives. So what they did was they did the simple solution of they put super glue in the thumb drives. So that's so you can't get your a thumb drive in it, right? So the USB port now has got a big glob of glue goo in it. So what she did, which is pretty smart, is then she went to their IT department and registered for an ergonomic keyboard, a wireless ergonomic keyboard, so that she could now, because she you know, claimed to have carpal tunnel because of all the data entry she'd been doing. Well, she ordered that specific keyboard because it had a USB port in the top of the keyboard that now instead of using it for the machine, she used it through the keyboard and was able to use that instead, instead of IT going through and disabling the, the, the keyboard themselves. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, you see a lot of that. There's people who are so talented and have great ideas but instead of using it for a positive, you know, for something positive, they use it for something, you know, of this nature to really just to steal information or, you know, just, just kind of outside of this example, there's people who will spend a lot of time finding ways to not do the work that's assigned to them. Right. Rather than just actually doing what's assigned to them, that would be easier. But yeah, it, it ties in with these individuals as well. Like it just, you know, they could probably do, a lot of them could probably go so far just using their talents for a positive purpose. Yeah, and you know, it, it, and it's scary because there, there's we get involved in you know code pink accident you know and incidents and things like that. So the, where we sometimes find a blatant, you know, we're a septet kind of security folks, so we want to harden from the outside, closer to tar- you know, it's equal or better as it gets closer, and we'll find a door lock that's broken on an exterior door that should be secured at all times, and sometimes we'll tell security like, hey, we need to get that door fixed. I'm like, nope. If somebody comes to that door, I'll arrest them right away. We're like, no, well, let's prevent that from happening, right? So, and 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 what what that comes from is the simple things of people don't understand. There must be, you know, th- this wood block manufacturer out there that's selling these, you know, all these wood blocks to you know keep doors open so people can go outside and smoke. But those will bend the frame to the doors, right? And as you bend the frames to the doors, the doors don't close; they don't latch anymore. Well, where we see those is in the areas where there's the critical infrastructure as well. So why that's a cyber event, which should be under consideration is half the time, the engineers, if you look underneath the keyboard, the, the username and password to the building management systems is written down on it, or it's on a wall or they share it. Well, then I install ransomware and now I own your elevators, I own your escalators, I own something, or I own your cert and guess I'm going to force you to pay me in order to remove that, that uh, ransomware. So it, it really, it's, you know, the culturally it's important as was kind of mentioned before. No, no, that makes perfect sense. Now, one thing that I, I'm actually curious to see if you've had to deal with in this part of the world, I know it was a, a big, a really big story in Israel a few years ago, but the cyber attacks on 
actual medical equipment and you know the potential <laughs> impacts of that yeah so you know it's so one of the organizations that i go to um i try to go to every year it's an organization called defcon and what it is it's an, it's it, it's an international uh, hacker convention like people that are there to to learn to do interesting things so i obviously stick out like hey he's not a hacker he's a, he looks like you know the narc of the group which is fine um, it's, it's, it's 20,000 people in Vegas. It's to the point where they tell you, don't even take your phone with you because people are trying to hack in it. You go and you see people are creating all these, you know, wireless, wireless networks, you know, it's for you to hop on with your phone. It's, it's actually brilliant. Not only do they tell you what to do, what their, what their product does, but on these massive screens, they show you the code to write this software so you can do that with the work. It's, it's, it's incredible. But one thing that really took me back, you know, two years ago, pre-COVID, which shocked me, scared me, was the firmware updates on Bluetooth devices, such as pacemakers, mm -hmm. that they're installing malware and ransomware on these so that when you download the firmware, the, the security upgrade, the, 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 the patch, like, like we all have in our computers, they're actually installing they're installing malware on there to where you've got to pay a ransom to get the update to make sure your pacemaker continues to work. Wow. It's again, they could, they could cure cancer if they, if they looked at it the right way. No, no. Th and th thank you for going into that. That's a, you know, it's, that, I know that's a topic that could have potential like serious, really serious ramifications potentially if, if it were to be a more widespread problem, but yeah, um, I'm glad that it hasn't become one here. And I know there's a lot of people doing work to prevent that. So hopefully you know, they're able to continue that work. Now, I know we, we covered a lot of different topics. Is there, is there anything I haven't mentioned yet that you'd like to discuss further? Well, no, I just think, again, the, um, the, I think that hospitals inherently are very good about training, right? And, and process flow and training. Um, it's hard to get, especially when you look at an organization that's open 24 hours a day and employs sometimes thousands and thousands of people, right? It's, it's, it's challenging to ask a nurse, to say, hey, I need you to go and take this class, you know, to an auditorium, um, and that's going to put, you know, patient impact, you know, spread. It's an impact. I understand that. I respect that. But I will tell you the, you know, all the way from that person that you first walk in as you're registering in the ED, right, that they need to be aware from the a top down all the potential things that bad that could happen if you click on that link. If you don't, if you leave your machine to step away for a second and you're in the front of your machine is visible, right? To where you go through and someone could see uh, who, who's being you know, registered next to you. Taking a cell phone picture is very, very simple. That they understand the value of changing the password, making it and, and locking your screen as you walk away is extremely important. I think that we've all been to doctor's visits where we walk in you know, after the patient previous is now out of the room and their information is still on there because it hasn't hibernated quickly enough. Those are things that really can happen. And those are things that do happen to gain information. So the availabilities are there. The other side of it is, is that everybody should have, a, should have the kind of capacity. And when you, when you look at the organization of a high reliable network or a high reliable organization, you know, the, from the floor cleaner to the, to the person in the cafeteria, all the way to the CEO, should have the ability to say no, or I'm curious, or know how to escalate. So when you see someone walk around the hallway that doesn't have a badge, or their badge is for a different hospital, or their badge is just generic, it says visitor, or it says contractor, or it says something on it, they should be able to go up to them and ask them and stop them and say, who are you here to see? And then, and then follow up to make sure that that is accurate. Because I'll tell you, I show up sometimes in my, in my coveralls, and I say, hey, can you take me to your network closet? And security will take me directly to the network closet. And once I'm inside that network closet, I can do whatever I want to do. And that's not good. That's not good. Everybody should have proper visitor credentialing systems, contractor credentialing systems. Security should be aware of what's going on in the area. Hospitals are under constant con construction upgrades. IT needs to be involved from the very front end so they understand any kind of impacts to what's going on in the area, as well as security administration. It's, a, it's an important feature that, that oftentimes is, is, not, is not communicated, especially as cameras go IP. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we've already seen some of the challenges 
that can potentially come with that. It's, I tell you, um, the, the cameras that are out there now, we have found CCTV systems that have two that are sending out to two different IP addresses. So you know about one, we you don't know about the other one. So and they they are the brands that are on the hot list. Okay, now there a couple things there, and one thing that you actually mentioned earlier that I, I want to kind of circle back to was the uh, the fraud triangle. Would you mind uh, elaborating on that just for any of us who may not have that that knowledge or understand the context of what your what the fraud triangle is? All right. So within the fraud triangle, you've got opportunity. So that's someone that has exposure to what's going on in the area. They have the ability to do, you know, something. The rationalization is someone that feels that they, that they're owed or they, they put in their, their dues and they should be given this type of, um, this type of gift. If you know, they, they typically consider it a gift or something that they, that they owed or that they, they feel like, oh, well, you know, Hey, it's, it's not that much. So they probably won't ever miss it. Right. So that's the rationalization. Then the other side is the pressure. So pressure is is extremely important, especially in security. When when you have somebody, um, let's say that you know has lost their job or is injured, unable to work, or something that happens, or some kind of some kind of um, heightened event, then you've got the pressure that adds to that. So now um, that comes into a lot of tiger kidnapping kind of things like that. To where if I'm under pressure to get something, I'm told, hey, I, I've got to do this in order to survive. So when you have those three components of the fraud triangle, then that's what happens. Uh, that's that's what really kind of can create some opportunities there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for uh, thank you for breaking that down. Now, you know, as as we're kind of starting to wrap up here, I, I'm just curious, what can we expect from you in the future or from your organization? Yeah. So you know, I'd love to see some type of balance um, between con- between convenience and security. It's amazing how many times that, and this is going to sound terrible, from a from a simple access control perspective, how things have been deactivated because a physician says, hey, I don't have always have my access card on me and I need to get through that door quickly, right? I think that all hospital security folks can kind of recognize that. But, you know, knowing the inherent risks of, well, beyond that door equals this and beyond that door equals that, right? And to understand the downstream impacts that are a part of that, I think that that as hackers or actors, as we call them, are able to, to kind of penetrate hospitals, clinics, insurance companies to be able to find this information, it's important. Technology is advancing so rapidly that the automation is going to address a large percentage of these threats. So that's something to kind of to always kind of be considerate of that, that technology is forward, right? Forward moving, it's Moore's law. Anything after 18, 18 months, it's extinct at this point. So as the infrastructure continues to, to, to grow, they need to understand that the, the IT departments and the server rooms and the kind of communications closets, that those are the brain, that's the brain, right? That feeds the nervous system and feeds everything else. That's how the hospital is in motion at that point is typically from a, from a resource or resource within the IT field. So if you look at that as hardening it from a PII perspective, then, then harden that. You know, I, the other side is the physical records portions of it it should be treated very, very highly with a lot of respect. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to look at patient records offsite and it's in a warehouse and the windows are broken and you can reach in and grab papers, right? You can grab the hospital records and, and you have that information and, and there's no cameras around it because, oh, it's just an old warehouse. Make sure that the kind of stuff that's going through there, uh, you know, technology and security is getting cheaper and cheaper, which is a great thing. Take advantage of that build into your capital expenditures, work with your local law enforcement, develop your community plans to become in part with the community to make sure that you are the trusted advisor for the community, that pa- that patients feel safe, that they know that they can go there and they're not gonna have all these malicious things happen to them from a, cy- a cyber perspective because someone didn't lock a door or someone propped a door open. Excellent stuff. Now, do you have a, a special message for the healthcare security cast community? Yeah, you know, I tell you, the, the biggest thing is, you know, kind of continue to build relationships and share, you know, I think is, is kind of the biggest portions of that, where I, where I mentioned, um, you know, the, the IHSS, which is an incredible organization, you know, the publications that come out of there, there's the IT departments, I think, really could do more, I think, in general, to where they could start talking to their management or have a presence at the table to talk about events that have happened. So I know that, 
you know, I publish stuff on LinkedIn and others publish stuff on from cyber events. And it's amazing how healthcare is a prime target right now for on the cyber event forward facing community. It's important to understand that people are their first line of defense, that if they act, if they say something, if they if they notice something, if they escalate appropriately, that's extremely important. And that needs to happen more and more often. Excellent. And I guess one last thing that I'll ask you, do you think we'll ever get to a point where we see a more synergistic relationship between our security directors and our IT security directors and leaders? Do you think they'll, they'll ever, will ever get to a point where those two groups work better together? You know, it's been my experience that that kind of cooperation, right? And when I say cooperation, it's cooperation. You know, they operate independently, right? I am a big believer that, hey, security doesn't need to be in a server room, right? Because it, then that removes that kind of access that, that, hey, it can't be me, I can't get in there, right? So I believe that there are the convenience factors we kind of mentioned earlier, that if security and, and IT infrastructure are basically have the same mission, if they're, I've seen to where uh, organizations that the, that the CAO or the COO run those departments to in the same organization in the same verticals, mm -hmm. they, they end up working better together than instead of one working for in finance under the finance and then one under operations or one under facilities and then one under security. You know, we see that the more that they are under the same mission, the same focus, then there's a lot, lot more cooperation there, which is a, which, which is actually a healthier place to be. Right. Yeah. Cause I just think there's so many opportunities to support each other's, to support each other's outcomes at the end of the day. Now, the, the last thing I'll ask, what is the best way for us to connect with you? Uh, you know, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. Um, uh, you know, um, the, there's, there's plenty of publications that are out there for people that, that are, are, are following me or, or um, listen to what we say. The other, you know, the other, the other part of it is, is that, you know, our company website, uh, lowersriskgroup.com is probably the easiest way to, you know, to, to kind of drill down to find information. Um, I've had the, the, the blessing and opportunity to work with some some security hospital professionals that are well known in this industry have written books, right. That I have a huge, highly regard for, and I've learned more there than they'll, you know, I've learned more from them than they'll forget. So I enjoy, you know, kind of still working in the environment and understanding um, healthcare is, is a special passion and it needs to be a passion. Right. And actually, yeah, you, you mentioned those group of professionals you work with some of them who've written Ben Scaglione was one of them, correct? Yes, he was probably one of the, not only not only one of the tallest men I've ever met, <laughs> but uh, but one of the just a genuinely the one of the night you you learn from him without actually knowing that you're learning, and his approach and his address with people is so de-escalating for such a for such a, a tall big guy. Uh, he's he's an amazing amazing human being. Absolutely, couldn't agree with you more on that one. All right, well, Brad, I appreciate your time. I thank you for this conversation. And again, this was a very valuable discussion. Oh, perfect. No, I appreciate it. Anytime. If you have any questions, please reach out. The Healthcare Security Cast is available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music and Audible, and many other platforms as well. Check out our link tree on your computer or mobile device. And this can be found at linktree slash Brian Hamilton. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Brian, B-R-I-N-E, Hamilton. Again, that's L-I-N-K tr.ee slash Brian Hamilton. Or if it's easier, send me a text at 647-372-2042. That's 647-372-2042. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have or share any links you may be looking for. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, take care and stay safe.